things like pocket water. It goes into a lot of detail in pocket water. Uh, drop pocket water, especially when you have a few pockets through a, a, a relatively uniform uh, riffle. That pocket water, are, those are trout magnets. That's like the corners of your living room that uh, that accumulate the dust bunnies. Everything gets swept down river, but the food gets concentrated in the pockets. Well, what gets concentrated in the pockets is mostly those types of invertebrates that don't swim as well. That was Jason Randall breaking down river currents, one topic from his trout fishing book trilogy, today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Today's episode is sponsored by the Wet Fly Swing Member Society. The society provides exclusive discounts and access to innovative products and services from our member partner companies. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash members to check out some of the companies who are on board. Plus, you can support the, the uh, podcast at one convenient location. In today's episode, I talk with Jason Randall, who has put together a number of fly fishing resources over the years. Jason describes the difference in nymphing styles between uh, Landon Mayer and Joe Humphreys, the importance of tension in detecting strikes, and where to find spent flies in the stream. Don't miss this one as Jason talks about his veterinarian job and how this relates to the work he has done around uh, trout and fly fishing. So, without further ado, here's Jason Randall. How's it going, Jason? Hey, great, Dave. How you doing? Good, good. good. I, I've been uh, I've been circling around, you know, chatting. I think I uh, ran into. Well, obviously, you're, I've you know heard about you quite a bit. You got a lot of information out there. But I think Ben uh, Ferimsky mentioned you in uh, a book or something that was out there. I, th- I guess you've written a few books. I mean, we're going to get into all, everything you've done, but um, maybe before we start, can you just talk a little bit about um, how you first got into fly fishing? Oh, you bet. I think. Like most anglers, I, I got into fishing with my dad. Uh, I, I learned as a as a uh, young man, a young boy, standing next to him, watching him fish. He was a spinner fisherman, a tackle fisherman, and uh, you know I just grew uh, to love the outdoors. Not only fishing, but you know anything outdoors, camping, hiking, hunting. And then I learned fly fishing later from other mentors, people that helped introduce me to the sport and then guide me through it. People like Darren Sakis, George Custon, Bob Nicholson. These guys took a real interest in me 25 years ago, probably, or more, and uh, taught me the basics. They Actually, they started me fishing wet flies because they thought that that was probably just an easy way to, to learn. It's not a difficult technique. Uh, you don't have to worry about a lot of of uh techniques as far as mending and things like that it's 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 a pretty pretty agreeable technique for a beginner and uh, later on i learned and was mentored by some of the the greatest names in our sport people like lefty cray um helped me tremendously not only as an angler but as a person too and people like ed jabarowski both of those guys took a real interest in me and taught me how to cast and help me grow and progress and just the, the latest book that i i just finished up last year is called nymph masters fly fishing secrets from expert anglers and through that i got a chance to fish with uh, 10 of the top anglers in the sport uh, as far as nymph anglers and um, some of those uh, joe humphreys uh, and, uh, learned a lot from him as well and and people like george daniel and landon mayer it's just it's just so much fun we all love the camaraderie sport uh, uh, aspect of our sport, and it really it, it occurs uh, amongst all of us. Yeah. No, and you mentioned a, a bunch of huge names. What do you think? And we're going to get into the wet fly stuff here a little bit, uh, on, um, as well as some other the areas where you fish quite a bit. But you know, and I've interviewed Joe in the past and some other big names. I mean, what do you think separates the um, you know kind of the best? From the because it seems like it's a little confusing out there because there's so much, especially when you think of nymphs, you know, Euro nymphing, uh, Gary Borg, I had Gary Borger. I mean, there's all this nymphing. I mean, is it all kind of the same or, you know, what separates the guys that are kind of leading versus the other people? 
Well, you know, I think for so many of us, um, just working on this project, Nymph Masters, this book took me to fish with uh, some of the leading anglers in our sport, Landon Mayer, Ed Engel, the people we already mentioned, uh, Tom Baltz, Ben Ferimsky, um, uh, Gary Borger, Joe Humphreys, Lefty, some of the top people in our sport, George Daniel. It was amazing to me. As I fished with each of them, some of the, um, well, they, they all solved the problems of nymph fishing, maybe in a slightly different way. Some of them, you know, use different techniques and methodologies, but they really solved the, the problem of nymph fishing, which essentially is contact, two points of contact. We need our flies to be in contact with the strike zone, which is often the bottom, uh, especially in faster flowing water. And then the second point of contact is we need a more linear connection with our flies rather than having a strike indicator that has a ton of subsurface slack between the strike indicator and the flies. Uh, a more linear connection or contact with the flies allows us to have a more reliable means of strike detection. And it was surprising to me how each of these experts solved the, 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 the dilemma, achieving these two, two points of contact in entirely different ways. Yeah. And what would be if you looked, say, for example, you worked with, I think you said Joe Humphreys and, um, you know, say, well, if you, let's go old school, you know, Joe Humphreys, who's who's 90, I think, or somewhere exactly. there versus, um, say, a Landon Mayer. I mean, I, maybe yep. he learned from Joe. But what do you think if you just look at those two guys that can you like pinpoint a difference between their nymphing tactics? Absolutely. The f one of the funniest things, but one of the truest things that I learned in the times that I fished with Joe Humphreys, he told me the difference between a good nymph angler and a great nymph angler is an extra split shot. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, it just emphasizes how important that that uh, point of contact is. Our flies have got to have contact with the, the strike zone, which in many cases is, and is the bottom. The faster the flow the more that is true. Whereas someone like Landon, he has a whole different approach to nymph fishing. Um, he uses a lot of suspension devices, but he uses them in a very unique way to also achieve that perfect drift. He he does a lot of tension drifts, a lot of of uh, well, a lot of the the mayflies out by him are are maybe sulfurs, uh, some of the nymphs that can swim very very well, blueing olives, and so a lot of his uh, uh, nymphing is under tension, giving an element of animation um, to the drift, uh, as opposed to somebody like Ed Engel or Gary Borger, who both of those guys probably fish strike indicators as well as anybody I've ever fished with. But they really work to balance that rig to try to get those two points of contact, to try to keep those flies in the strike zone first element of contact being contact of our flies with the bottom of the strike zone the second point of contact is they try to have that more linear connection or contact with the flies so that they can register those strike to uh, strikes a little bit more accurately mm. so and you mentioned with with landon the tension how, how is his style does he use a lot of indicators or what is the tension uh that, that style what do you mean by the tension well, what he does is he uses a real small indicator. Oftentimes, it's a clear indicator, so it's less offensive to the trout, less disruptive to their feeding. Uh, trout don't like those bright, glowing indicators, especially after they, yeah, uh, you know, capture the sun on a real sunny day. They don't like big orange or pink orbs floating right over their head. So he uses a clear one that looks a little bit more like a, a, a foam bubble uh, or a water uh, air bubble on the surface. And then he, he casts a relatively short um, presentation kind of downstream and across, mends once to get a little sink, and then uh, allows that to swim across the face mm. of, of trout in feeding positions. I see. I see. Okay. Well, let's, um, yeah, let, let's swing back to the, the nipping if we have time uh, later on here, but I wanted to touch on uh, some of the wet fly fishing and I had uh, Davey Watton on in a past episode and it was a great oh, episode. Davey's, he's yeah. good. Yeah. He, he went, uh, you know, in depth and, and his was a little bit different than at least, you know, my experience kind of with the wet fly fishing is just kind of wet fly swing, obviously the name of the, the show here, but 
you know, with him, he was talking about this cast of uh, flies and casting upstream and all these different little techniques. Can you explain what your, um, how you learned how to wet fly fish and then how you do it today? Well, I think that the, the way I learned is probably the simplest way, which is probably um, the easiest for me as a beginner at that point, 25 or 30 years ago, which is just kind of a more or less a downstream and across cast, uh, maybe one or two men's uh, to allow those flies to sink a little bit and then to slow them down a bit too during the swing. I mean, we don't want to have those skating and ripping across the currents when they come to this uh, swing phase and essentially we can divide the presentation for wet flies into two distinct stages one is going to be kind of that dead drift phase during which the the flies will sink so frequently that's a mend or two during that that stage and then trying to achieve a relatively direct and and linear connection to those flies during the swing so it's more or less a straight um, direction a straight line between the rod tip and the flies kind of following them slightly leading them through the swing and and that's the way i learned since then i've really come to appreciate the many variations of presenting soft tackles and wet flies, including like Davey's technique um, or, or Dave Hughes's technique, some of the many techniques he discusses in his book, where you're going to try variations on presentations. And now, I oftentimes, I'll put a wet uh, a fly, small wet fly, like, uh, you know, maybe a small picket pin or something like that, or a soft hackle. See, a lot of soft hackles now in combination with nymphs where you can do your dead drift nymph presentation and then kind of allow that either to rise like Lysen ring taught us or even swing across currents like a wet fly. So you, combination, you're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of, of uh, yeah, I don't know if they're morphed techniques or right. whatever, but they're using elements of, of, of different classic styles anyway to, to try to get a few more fish in the net. Gotcha, gotcha. So if you were... If you were brand new to, you know, to the wet fly fishing or swinging or whatever, you know, what would you tell somebody who's new to it? Like what, you know, what do they need as far as a line, a setup, and maybe you can just go into some of the leader, just the, the basics to get somebody who's uh, brand new to it. Well, I probably, uh, I probably started with just the basic stuff. We were using probably a nine foot, uh, um, leader, um, fishing two tie, uh, flies in tandem. Oftentimes just, uh, fishing them, uh, you know, the, uh, second fly from the hook shank, uh, tied to the hook shank with 18 or, or 20, uh, inches of, of tippet between the two flies, tying the second fly from the hook shank of the first fly. And I was using floating lines. We were fishing. I cut my teeth on the Paramarquette River and the Muskegon River in uh, Michigan, and uh, we would just cast this over a lot of uh, eight inch to probably twenty eight inch riffles or so, and and uh, it, it worked. It worked very very well. Mm -hmm. um, so our system was pretty simple. I know there's a lot of different variations according to depth and. There's a lot of new, um, I think, a new, a lot of new gear leader line variations. But I think I, if I'm going to go to wet flies, I, I typically go pretty much to that very simple um, setup that I started with. Okay, and so you're basically finding, and then the water that you're looking for. I mean, you've you've written a couple books, I guess, about the water. One of them, you, where you talked about the the current. Um, you know, some of the different, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the books that, and how they fit into where you've touched on, the, on wet fly swinging or just fishing wet flies. Well, sure. The first book, I, I, I was a fisherman probably for 15, maybe 20 years, probably or more at that point where I really um, started to notice that there was a, a kind of a need in our fly fishing literature for something of a more scientific uh, you know, a direction, I think, in, in sharing information. And there's so many good books by so many good authors out there. But I really, I didn't see a, a book that really addressed the structure and complexity of current and how that not only impacts uh, trout in the food that they eat, but also us as anglers, 
how do we have to adjust and relate to trout in our presentation? I mean, how do we have to adjust and relate to current in our presentation? So that's what really motivated me to um, to look into the concept uh, that led to that first book called Moving Water. And I, I discussed it with Jay Nichols, uh, the editor um, at Headwater Stack uh, Stackpole Books. And I, I thought, you know, I think there's an opportunity here. I don't see a book out here that really looks at the complexity of current um, and I think, um, uh, you know, we, we sat down and we hashed it out and we came up with the concept of moving water. And then he thought there's also an opportunity for a trilogy of books. And so that's that seed germinated into what's now called the Fly Fisher's Guide uh, Trilogy, which is moving water, the Fly Fisher's Guide to Currents feeding time, the fly fisher's uh, guide to what, when, and where trout eat. And then Trout Sense, the third book in the trilogy, which is uh, the fly fisher's guide to what trout see, hear, and smell. And some of this goes back to, yeah, I want to make uh, the connection to the, uh, you know, especially when we talk about currents and velocities and all that and how that applies to wet flies. But some of this goes back to your background, right, as a, uh, you're a veterinarian? In, for I am. Yeah. Well, can you, can you talk a little bit about your, I guess that's, that's kind of your day job or you, and what, what you did there and what, um, you know, what, what that line of work was like. Sure. And I still do. I'm still a, uh, I'm semi-retired as a practicing veterinarian, but I, I graduated veterinary school and yeah, I've always, uh, as I said, grew up with the outdoors and fishing and hunting and, and later on fly fishing. But it really motivated me, my love for, rivers and streams and trout uh, led me to get further training after veterinary school where I, uh, I became certified in fish health and medicine through the University of Wisconsin's program. And that would allow me to work in the, in the fisheries and, and fishery biology industry. But once I, I got to that point, I got a tremendous education and, and really grew um, in that uh, uh, knowledge of, of uh, trout and, and their habitat. But once I got to that point, I really decided I didn't want to work in, in fisheries. So I still continued to grow and in, in to uh, study the research in those areas relating to trout and stream and river ecology so I continued to grow in it and, and learn and I think I think that's probably what what I was able to share I think in the in that uh, the first three books the trilogy I see okay so and and then maybe you can and so your job what what did I'm just trying to get I mean when I think of veterinarian I think of my you know usually my daughters would say well they want to be a veterinarian they want to work, work with horses and, oh, you know, yeah. and stuff like that what I mean when you're working with fish can you explain uh, paint that picture like what that looks like for somebody who's never heard of that sort sure. of a job Sure you bet you bet and I still I still would go into uh, you know, a couple of days a week, I'm semi-retired now, but I'm still a general practicing veterinarian. So I still take care of dogs and oh, really? horses. I don't, I don't, I don't do veterinary work on horses, but we have horses and we, we've had dairy cattle. And, Crazy, and so yeah. I've been in the agricultural okay. side of veterinary medicine. And, but I've, I've been on the floor at, at uh, uh, fish hatcheries and, and uh, salmon ranches in Alaska. Mm. And, and I've been in uh, hatcheries in Illinois and Wisconsin and things like that. And, and yeah. what it really does kind of a cool experience, like the, the salmon ranching in, in Alaska, we were sorting uh, salmon by species on the floor and, and they, they, uh, they can certainly harvest a certain percentage of those fish that come through um, the station and they allow a tremendous number of those fish to pass through. Um, and then they have a, a release program to uh, release a certain uh, percentage higher than what they harvest. And it's kind of a unique concept because I think it's what really brings like wild caught salmon back into our, 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 our food system. So are you looking at, so you're kind of, are you, and you're looking at fish health? Like, so what, so you might be yep. like, how, how would you be different than say a, a ecologist or a biologist, somebody that's working around fish? Well, you bet. It's a, basically it's it's my training is as a veterinarian first, uh, understanding the 
you know, biology and physiology of, of fish. Uh, and then uh, my first article uh, was an article on an, a, an invasive species, viral hemorrhagic septicemia, a base, an invasive disease that's been entering into the Great Lakes fisheries. And so uh, gotcha. it, uh, it, my relationship allows me to, uh, to have membership in like the, well, it used to be called the North American Benthic Society, yep. but now it's called the Society for, for uh, Freshwater Science. It allows me to have access to a lot of their their um, current research and working with uh, with people in those fields has led me to have relationships with the the leading experts in the world on like fish vision. So when I did Trout Sense, I had access to these uh, these experts on fish vision and and. I was able to discuss these things with them and, and they shared with me at that point research that had yet, not yet at that point been published and some of the current, very, very uh, current thinking in, in like trout vision and how about the role of ultraviolet light in trout vision? What does that really look like? And so I think it allows me to bring that information, I think, to the uh, to the fly fishing world. Gotcha. Yeah, I was uh, I was chatting with Ed, uh, Ed Engel. You mentioned he was on in a past episode, and and we talked a little bit about the color purple. D- did you yep. get into colors? I'm not sure where that all came from, but is there some some uh, something there with purple? It's a not a natural color, but fish seem to like it. Absolutely, and Ed is is just a phenomenal angler and just great company on the river. Um, he's just a, a fun guy to spend uh, spend time with. Fishing yeah, definitely. Excellent, excellent fisherman. As Does well. he ever tell you any any stories about the? Uh, I think he was the one that said he went to um, uh, what was it the the big concert Woodstock, right? You ever, oh yeah. You ever oh, hear any Woodstock goodness. stories? Oh, for Matt, sure. Yeah. Sure. I'm not sure we could share them all on, that's on your right. podcast. No, we're all, but... you could, it's, we're totally, that's the great thing <laughs> okay. about the podcast. It's all free here. You go, you know. <laughs> okay. So we could talk smack on each other. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, oh, it's good, all totally good. open, but uh, no, oh, so, but, but is, is the purple, is, is that a, is that a reality? That's something that you should be yeah, adding to your Yeah. Blue flies? and purple. Yeah. yeah. I think blue and purple both are, you know, have some type of a, of an effect on trout. Um, it's probably not the most naturally occurring color. So really, how does that, uh, how does that play into their, their natural color perception? Again, some of this stuff is, uh, I, I, I go back to the book Data's proper wrote many, many years ago, what the trout said. And all we can do since we cannot have a conversation with trout is we have to infer their responses from their their behavior. And so we do know from their responses um, to the blue and purple colors that there's some kind of a positive attractor there. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we cannot interview a trout and ask them specifically what it is about that. But we do know from watching their responsive to different uh, stimuli that they do have some type of uh there is something about blues and purples that uh is appealing to them how does that really relate um you know in a, in a more specific sense i don't know if we'll ever know yeah. but uh things like ultraviolet light um ultraviolet light is uh um is a uh there's three different receptors uh color receptors that they have that we have as well um they have the same cones I kind of wanted to, I mean, you hit on, I think, there with the blue and purple uh, colors that's covered. And then the UV, so that is a real popular thing these days. In fact, I actually, you know, had a Rick Hayfley on, and it was pretty, you know, oh, that yeah. guy, you know, obviously super knowledgeable. But he didn't have a good um, response just because he hasn't fished a lot of the UV stuff. Sure. But have you, I mean, so there's there's data out there, there's research that shows oh, yeah. you know, UV, and, and that's you you've seen that. Absolutely. Well, and, and Rick is a, is a extremely knowledgeable um, angler and a scientist as well. Uh, he's a, he's a, I think he's a PhD entomologist. So yeah. his uh, his uh, information and in, in scientific knowledge is, is uh, very impressive. And insects obviously do have a lot of ultraviolet light um, perception in their sense of sight, but. The newer data, and and this is always changeable. Um, we learn more once we believe the world was flat, right? And right. and obviously, data continues to uh, to change our our essentially our our understanding of these things. So we might find that this this uh, maybe changes in five years, but right now, 
according to the, the current data that we have available, um, trout have um, a specific ultraviolet sensitive cone uh, up to the point of about par stage, which is a couple inches in length or smultification stage for those species that migrate the, uh, the anadromous species. After that, that specific receptor seems to switch to more blue light sensitivity, leaving only a residual capacity for ultraviolet light sensation. So what we, we currently believe now in the scientific community is that trout do not have a very strong sense of ultraviolet perception. They, they probably have a very, very weak perception of that, but it's probably not a major um, component to their feeding behavior. Mm-hmm. Probably is not anything of significance. That, that, again, is a current level of understanding. Also, ultraviolet light is not very well transmitted in fresh water. Mm-hmm. It do- probably doesn't transmit more than a few inches because uh, it's mostly absorbed. Where in the marine systems, uh, it's probably more relevant to tuna and some of those fish that are, you know, in blue water environments where ultraviolet light is more easily transmitted because it's closer to the to the ambient light there in those environments. Um, and it, it uh, probably has a greater significance in the feeding behavior of those fish. But freshwater fish... Um, probably yeah. not a big deal okay so but and that pe- doesn't yeah. mean people are using that doesn't mean right they're still yeah, using stuff sure. they're still using it out there me too yeah me too i'm still using uv light uh i'm using uv uv dubbing material um and it it works but it's probably not because of that material's ultraviolet light uh, capabilities. It's probably more like if you look at that uh, yeah. UV light material, it has a natural iridescence. It it's kind of yeah. a a a, 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 a like it changes purplish blue. It's almost like it has a little bit of the purplish blue in there mixed in somehow. You bet. It's like the the head of a mallard uh, mm-hmm. drake. It changes yep. depending on the angle that you view it from. It could or, be or green peacock. or blue or purple. Peacock is probably peacock the best girl. natural. Yeah. You bet. Absolutely. So there's probably something about it that's an attractor. What it is specifically, yeah. I, I think it has more to do with its natural gotcha. iridescence than no, anything else. It, it, makes, it, it makes sense. And it's funny because, you know, I think it comes back to the confidence fly. You know, I think some of the guys are calling them confidence patterns or whatever, but yeah, that's the bottom line. If you're confident in the pattern, you're probably going to catch more fish on it. And that's, that's the most important Absolutely. thing. Yeah. And I think that goes back to us. What's between our ears. You know, when we have our confident pattern on, we're in the zone, we're focused, we know we're going to catch fish. So we're paying attention. Yeah. I, I wanted to go back to that, um, on the currents because you really studied, you know, that was one of your books was focused on that. How does that, you know, maybe you can explain a little bit about, you know, that book for somebody who hasn't read it and how you would apply some of the information there to, to fishing wet flies. Absolutely. Well, those books, the, each one of them attacks a different scientific topic within the sport of fly fishing. And they're very, informationally dense they're like textbooks so i i kind of warn people ahead of time these uh the trilogy the fly fisher's guide trilogy was designed uh, by really the publisher and the editor jay nichols to be kind of the reference huh. set of books for gotcha. our sport so how they, does that uh, it, it interrupt you for a second because i was thinking i mean so it's this referencing i mean how do you keep that for somebody who wanted to write a book like that from from not being boring you know i mean i have a guy <laughs> one of my favorite you know one of my favorite kind of marketers i've mentioned this before in the show he's just a great he's really uh, knowledgeable is seth godin and one of his famous oh, yeah. one of his famous quotes is you know don't be boring <laughs> you know I mean, yeah, that, yeah. whatever content you're putting out there that's the number one thing i mean how do you do that in a, in a book like you're talking about how do you keep from being boring well, the, 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 the philosophy of this book is to stand out from the crowd. So stand out from the ones that are trying to not be boring. There you go. <laughs> so essentially, it's a very scientific um, handling of these topics. It does weave in, um, uh, I think, very relevant fly fishing perspective in those books. And it, it does, um, I think, um, bring in, you know, we try to emphasize the points through, 
um, uh, yeah, a little bit of a story essay format you know, that right. weaves through the the narrative as well. But essentially, these books were designed to be more like textbooks, and they read like that. And and uh, when people pick them up, the first thing I tell them is, "This is not John Girock. Hmm. You know, Girock has got a very easy flow, and it's yep. fun to read, and it's very light, and you can read uh, 200 pages in an evening uh, by the fire." But this book is uh, Lefty Cray wrote the forward for the first. Hmm book moving water and he said that this is uh, a, a book that i have read um three times before he passed because of the amount of information that it contains and it's just it's it is it's going to be a little bit more like your your sixth grade science text gotcha so if you could take uh, you know say in a a few minutes so, you know maybe talk about a few of the highlights of of you know how currents and velocities how you might apply that to, to fishing with, you know, wet flies. Is it, could you do that? Talk a little bit about some of the, the sure. points in there just for somebody who hasn't read it. Well, just a couple of different things that, that I would bring out um, is that um, the, the movement of water and rivers is governed by two uh, physical forces, gravity and friction. And so gravity is a driving force in streams. If you take water above sea level, it's going to go downhill because of gravity. But wherever there's friction, um, from the stream, stream bank uh, or the stream bottom, that's going to slow uh, and dramatically slow um, that zone of water. So much so that if you're casting a dry fly across the surface of the water, that water in the center of the river is moving at full speed because it is unaffected by friction. But that water at your feet at the bank that water might not be moving at all, even though it's on the same downhill pitch. Well, if we cross these zones of, of uh, different current speeds, we're going to have drag. And so drag is the antithesis of presentation. Uh, but you also have this nymph fishing, too. The fastest flow, you have got to cut through those zones of fast flow in order to keep your flies near the bottom in fast water that's your strike zone um and and how are you going to try to cross those zones of fast flow and yet keep your drift speed relative to the strike zone which is maybe one quarter speed of the surface speed so it it again it poses those challenges of contact also just to throw out one specific example is around river bends Water does not just track around a river bend. It rolls around a river bend like a barber pole in a helical manner. So you have helical currents around river bends, and that creates at the surface a uh, cross current that moves from the inner bank to the outer bank, which is something every guide knows uh, that anybody that's rode a drift boat, you have got to point your, your bow at the outer bank as you go around it and pull away from it, or it's going to put you in the ground. It's going to, it's going to ground your boat in the bank. But at the, at the uh, stream bed, it creates a cross current moving in the opposite direction from the outer bank to the inner bank. Um, and so something like that, it goes into a lot more detail in the book. But um, those helical currents, as, as you have this barber pole rolling of, of current around a stream bed, it creates challenges for our angling, but also think of this. What does it do to food distribution? If you have a cross current that's moving towards the outer bank at the surface, look at the foam around a, a, a river bend. All that surface foam accumulates along the outer bank. That's where your crippled uh, uh, or spent uh, flies are going to accumulate after an emergence or after a spinner fall. That's where you're going to see sipping trout. So it affects food distribution because trout are aware of this. They go to the outer bank at river bends to, to extend their feeding activity maybe after the hatch is over or after the spinner falls over because those are food magnets. Things like pocket water, it goes into a lot of detail in pocket water. Uh, drop pocket water, especially when you have a few pockets through a, a, a relatively uniform uh, riffle. That pocket water, are, those are trout magnets. That's like the corners of your living room that, uh, that accumulate the dust bunnies everything gets swept down river but the food gets concentrated in the pockets well what gets concentrated in the pockets is mostly those types of invertebrates that don't swim as well uh, and so if you look at the population studies in pocket water it's probably 80 percent midges or scuds 
that should tell you what fly to put on right. when you're fishing pocket water. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, let's uh, let's move on a little bit to um, for a bit here to the the driftless area because that, that's kind of the area you live currently, right? You fish mostly. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. I that's what I consider my home waters, and and uh, you know when I travel all over the country and and uh, talk at shows and clubs and events, the driftless area is 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 kind of on everybody's bucket list. It's it's thousands and thousands of miles of small spring creeks that are just an absolute delight to fish, and it's it's just I it it's uh, it's just a, a wonderful area. Um, yeah. tremendous public access wisconsin has done a great job in ensuring public access and it's it's a it's a fun fishery so for so for somebody who hasn't been there it's mostly it's spring creeks that's what it's mostly made of or is there a mixture of different types of water types and fish no it's mostly going to be spring creeks there's a lot of class uh, one through three trout streams a lot of uh a lot of sustainable um, brown trout uh, fisheries in that area. There's some good size. Um, you know, a lot of times you're going to get several small uh, Spring Creek tributaries coming together to a larger flow. So there's some some better size um, streams and rivers there as well. Uh, some of the rivers are pretty pretty big, like the Bad Axe River and the Blue and the Green. Those are are fairly substantial um, mm-hmm. uh, small rivers, essentially. Um, whereas a lot of the other smaller creeks um, uh, are much are much more intimate and and uh, and tight uh, in their in their fishing approach and things like that. Gotcha. They call them. They call them coolies up there uh, a lot um, because of the French influence and the early French explorers. So you have things like Bohemian coolie and and Rulens coolie and Timber coolie and Spring coolie, and then a lot of times there there's their rivers or, or creeks as well. Okay, and the 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 coolie. What is the coolie thing? That's just the name of the uh, area, different areas. Yeah, I I, I think um, the the driftless area. Is really it gets its name um, from the glacial activity, or really the lack of the the recent glacial activity in the last ice age, which is what I don't know ten thousand yeah. years ago. I think is approximately it. But you had the uh, Des Moines Glacier coming in from the west, and you had the Green Bay Glacier coming in from the east, and they collided along the Mississippi Valley, but they never really encroached into the driftless area. And so the driftless area is like uh, a uh, a small three. Um, you know, it's part of the of three states: Wisconsin, um, Minnesota, and Iowa. Um, there's part of the driftless area occupies each of those three states. And but those glaciers never came through that area. They hit there, but they never encroached through there. And as those glaciers receded, they flattened out the territory around that uh, area. But then all the the melt off um, carved these deep ravines and coulees, essentially, oh, um, that led to the Mississippi um, Valley. And as the glaciers receded, they deposited the glacial set sedimentary material the ground up rich soils that the the farmers love and they call that glacial drift so as the, they as the glaciers uh, receded they deposited drift but there's no drift in the driftless area i see I got that's you. why that's where it gets its name driftless okay and, and it's mostly a like kind of a forested protected uh, kind of natural environment is that yeah and it reminds you kind of like maybe south central pennsylvania a lot of limestone um spring creeks with that kind of environment where you've got these deep ravines so uh, sometimes they're so deep it looks like you're you're um, down in the mountains um in the foothills Hmm. and uh each down at the bottom of each ravine or coulee well sometimes they call them hollows um you're going to oftentimes have a really nice trout stream i see I see. Okay, cool. And and do you have any? We are definitely on a little bit of a destination DIY type of season here, where I'm trying to hit some. I, we, I've been talking about some saltwater in other areas, but I and mean, what is the? Do you have any tips for somebody who wanted to go out there as far as maybe doing it themselves? And you know, is there a? Is it pretty easy just to run over there and pull up with your truck and start camping out, finding some good water? It fish? is. It is because I think the state of Wisconsin has done a magnificent job in in getting f- public access to a lot of these spring creeks, and those are well marked with parking areas. 
their Viroqua is uh, is kind of like the perfect trout town. Um, it's a very eclectic mix of, of uh, really cool little farm to fork restaurants, and there's a really good fly shop right in the town of Viroqua, and Viroqua kind of sits in the heart of the Driftless area. That fly shop is a Driftless angler. It's owned and operated by Matt Wagner and his wife, Jerry Meyer, oh, yeah. who both um, teach and guide there, and they do a lot of speaking as well uh, and sharing their love and passion for that area, but it's there's a uh, it's easy to find if you if you go in and talk to them at the fly shop they can get you rigged out for flies and get you headed in the right direction and and there's a lot of good signs uh, the DNR has done a great job of having public parking areas where it's very obvious there's no parking fees you just have your license hmm. and you wander uh, yep. up and down the stream and and uh, you fall in love with these little spring creeks do you, so do you it's, run into it's a easy. lot of people out there no, it's, it doesn't get a tremendous amount of pressure. Um, there's so many miles of streams that it can just accommodate uh, an awful lot of, of angling um, without uh, being crowded at all. Uh, I mean, oftentimes uh, they'll pull in someplace and I'm the only car there. Uh, what's the What's the best time of year, do you think, to go there? <laughs> Um, the season runs from, I think now, um, uh, early to mid January to mid October. Um, and I fish it, uh, pretty much throughout that entire time and it fishes very, very well. Yeah, I'm obviously going to maybe make adaptations in my approach, uh, as far as fly selection and, and methodology, but it fishes well. It, 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 it fishes very well, uh, in the early, um, uh, uh, spring, late winter. Uh, by April, you're starting to see some pretty uh, reliable hatches. Uh, you get a, we get a lot of tan and black caddis. We get some crane flies a little bit later. Get a mixed bag of mayflies, uh, blueing olives, and some uh, some different species of mayflies. We do have, um, you know, sporadic hatches of, of caddis. We do have some summer trichos in some streams. And uh, we have a tremendous hopper and ant uh, beetle um, opportunity yeah. there from mid-July through fall. Gotcha. But it, it fishes very, very well um, in all seasons. And, and uh, again, it's there's a lot of accommodation uh, in, uh, in and around that area. There's several different hotels and bed and breakfasts and it's just a pretty easy area to fall in love with. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds, sounds cool. So if somebody was heading over there, they could probably just, like you said, throw on a, get a basic setup and grab some soft tackles and swing some wet flies in there. Just grab a, a riff or some pocket water and downstream and across would be a pretty effective method. You bet. You bet. I think, uh, like an orange, uh, partridge, uh, soft tackle. I like a picket pin. It's kind of an old school yeah. wet fly for that, but it passes. I know you're going to know it, David. Yep. It passes for a lot of different bugs and it's just a buggy looking fly. And, and I think that works, uh, very, very well, um, as a, uh, as a wet fly. And, I think uh, it does have a lot of great dry fly opportunities, but it, it just it sets up very well. I think most spring creeks do for the Euro nymphing um, approach as well, which is uh, one of my favorite ways to fish. Oh, okay, so, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. So with the Euro nymphing, I've I've had um, you know a number of guests. Well, Devin Olson was on actually; he's already been on a couple times. But I mean, what is the difference between the Euro nymphing and some of the other nymphing methods? Do you think they're all they're all pretty effective, or Euro nymphing has a little bit of a a head start be just because the the setup with the thin leaders and all that well i think it goes back to those two points of contact and i think you can get those two points of contact with almost any method but you have to keep it in mind and i think the ways that we used to fish floating um you know the floating suspending devices like the classic thingamabobbers i think they the way that i used to fish them anyway um i was not anywhere close to, to getting those two points of contact, namely contact of our flies in the strike zone and a more linear connection or contact with those flies so I can de detect strikes. Mm -hmm. But I think since I become more aware of, of needing those two points of contact, um, you can change uh, using um, yeah, suspension devices, change the way and, uh, you use them, and, and also maybe what you use as a suspension device. But I think Euro-nymphing and high-sticking, which is a close cousin to that, 
um, I think inherently achieve those two points of contact. And I think they emphasize those two points of contact. And I think that's why they're so successful. Gotcha. That's the most important thing. Okay. Um, yeah. And you mentioned, you know, on, well, I've heard you, I guess, I think I heard you talking about this on a past, uh, podcast somewhere where you, you do a little bit of steelhead fishing as well. I do. Yep. Yeah. I do. Well, what's there? I'm always interested to hear. I'm not sure if do you, do you do some spay casting? Have you gotten into that? A little bit. I'm I'm still pretty new to spay casting, and I've I've really enjoyed what I've done. I've done a little bit. I've caught some coho on on some space mm-hmm. wings, and and I've done a little bit for trout. Um, but I'm I'm still relatively new to that uh, that part of our sport, so I, I certainly will not profess any expertise sure, at it. Sure. But mostly, what I do, uh, we've done. Uh, I've been. No, steelhead fishing for many many years i i'll be up there actually um the day after tomorrow i'll be heading up to fish with uh, an old friend jamie klaus uh in cadillac mission and have been fishing with him for probably 15 years or more and oftentimes uh, sometimes we'll do some center pinning Hmm. Um, for steelhead and sometimes we'll do um you know just bouncing some beads or egg patterns mm-hmm. close to the bottom gotcha that's right yeah this is not the <clears throat> you're not necessarily swinging flies for them um, out there because you're up in the michigan area right right we're yeah. going to be fishing the manistee river and the manistee river uh there are certain sections of it that set up very well to swing um, but, uh, so oftentimes there's a lot of snags and, and, oh, yeah. uh, irregularities and inconsistencies in the bottom and, and a lot of, uh, buckets and, 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 uh, level uh, water depth changes and things like that, that it doesn't really necessarily set up extremely well to swing, uh, many of those sections. Some of them do okay, yeah. but, um, you know, it, it does create some challenges, I think in that aspect. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And what do you think, um, you know, just, uh, I had a couple of questions here I wanted to, you know, ask about just, again, getting back to the books. I mean, you, you've written a few. Uh, how many books? You said you have three out? Three out? No, I've got four. Oh, four that's um, right. Yeah, Nymph Masters, Fly Fishing Secrets from Expert Anglers came out about almost two years ago now, a year and a half now. And uh, that was a couple of years in the, in the process, uh, a lot of uh, just background uh, material from each of these 10 experts and a lot of mm, time spent right. fishing with them, sharing their techniques and tips and making sure that you get it right. You know, if you put words in somebody else's mouth and, yep. and share some of their information, you've just got to make sure it's, it's accurate. That's right. That's right. What, what is, but that was a yeah. fun book. Yeah. Wow. That was cool. What, what do you think was the most, um, you know, what is the most challenging thing about writing, putting together a book? You know, I think um, probably uh, just being clear and informative and and uh, making sure that it's in a readable and somewhat entertaining format, um, I think, is uh, – is important but i think if i were going to share advice with uh, somebody that's that's really that is uh, some a dream of theirs or a goal of theirs it's just it's just uh, uh probably making sure that you discuss those ideas very very clearly and oftentimes face to face uh with an editor uh, to make sure that yeah, relationships are so important in our in our sport, and especially at that level, uh, the business side of our sport. I think it's it's uh, critical. Um, I think to to be able to develop those relationships and uh, shows are a great place. Uh, the Edison Show kind of is one of those opportunities oh, yeah. where many of the publishers of magazines and and the publishing houses for books are oftentimes at those shows gotcha. and. Ed- Edison is uh, is the old Somerset show, which is well, more or less in a suburb of New York and Newark and that area. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Are you going to be writing some more books as we as you go along? I think so. I, I've written probably thirty or forty magazine articles. Uh, I wrote four books in five years, so that was a very ambitious um, um, schedule, uh, and I think. I took about two years off after that uh, since uh, Nymph Masters was released just to kind of catch up and uh, decompress and to go back to the river and and, uh, let the river teach me some more and uh, grow and and, uh, hopefully develop uh, new ideas and Mm -hmm. techniques to be able to share in another book. Gotcha. Why do you, um, you know, why do you write the books and articles? Do you have a... 
you know? it's an artistic outlet i think it really i think it really uh, to me it satisfies a need uh it's almost like painting a picture and and to be able to to express uh, in clear terms uh ideas and concepts it's 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 a very rewarding and satisfying thing and i i enjoy it i like, I like the creative aspect of writing and and uh sharing those ideas with other people right right and there and there is a a monetary piece there right i mean is that a is that something you <laughs> yeah enjoy? you're gonna make yeah you'll make millions <laughs> that's right well it's it's staggering you know the 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 uh the it, no yeah actually it's 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 uh it, that's a modest part of of the whole equation yeah. it's um it's it's really um if you go into it with that <laughs> that idea i think you'll you'll probably be disappointed that's right. but um you know i think it's it's really more than that i think it, it it's just a really um something that i find i have found very uh, satisfying and rewarding is just to see a finished product in in your hands and right. the 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 uh it's a joy to to be able to see something like that a, a year or two of your life task commit uh, completed it's also a little bittersweet too it's like there's a all of a sudden this huge void in your life where where this requirement was but it's also from the moment that you hold that book in your hand there's this kind of niggling um nagging thought in your mind that i wish i could write it again because i know even in the year that i uh, since I've, I've written this because it's a, your book comes out a year after you've completed it typically oh, yeah. is that i just i know more now mm. i could have shared something new there's right. our, our sport has changed that's why there's so many new books our sports especially the nymphing uh, stuff has just changed. Look at how much changed in 20 years, 20 years ago. I was like, you're a nymphing. What's that? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's things change so quickly. The immediately you think, ah, I wish I could write that again. Right. Right. Well, and, and for the magazines, there is a, I mean, I'm just trying to get at, you know, for those out there that want to <clears> do some writing, maybe make some side cash. I mean, you make what a few hundred bucks on kind of average or something like that per article. It depends. Yeah. Some of them, um, a lot of guys are blogging now and, and, uh, oftentimes, you know, the, the blogs, it's just kind of a labor of love. Um, but it depends on the magazine. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can, you can, can make a, a pretty decent uh, return on investment depending on the magazine that you're writing for. I wrote for six years for American Angler, um, and uh, you know, I've got pieces coming out in Fly Tire and and uh, relationships developed with uh, Field and Stream. Oh, and, cool. and what, what does yeah. do, what do you what does American Angler uh, Angler on average per article do they? You know, it depends on whether you're writing uh, feature length articles or whether you're writing some tips. Um, I mean, if you're writing a short segment on on uh, on yeah, sharing a maybe tip. a couple of flies sure. or something like that, it doesn't pay very well. I mean, you might be looking at a few hundred dollars. And yeah. Feature pieces can can go many many times more than. Oh, that. really? So you might you might get a thousand bucks out of a, a really good <laughs> article. You could, oh, wow. yeah. I mean, it, depending on on who you're writing for, yeah. yeah. I mean, it could be anywhere, you know, from five hundred to a thousand dollars. Gotcha, sure. gotcha. Okay. So, and a, the final question on that line. So, if if there was no monetary return for any of the books or magazines, would you still keep writing at the same level? Um, you know, it's it's hard to say because. It's nice to have um, some offset to the tremendous investment of time, effort, and and also expense I, uh, to, that that's involved in these things. Uh, if you're writing a destination piece in Montana, uh, you've got to go out there and and get it right, and you might invest twice as much in in uh, what you're spending uh compared to what you might get as a return. So you do need. Uh, at a certain point, you need to be compensated, um, at least in part. But even then, if you're doing destination pieces, it might not even uh, it might not break even completely. But it allows you perhaps to kind of subsidizes your addiction, I suppose. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Yeah, I appreciate you 
expanding on that. I'm always interested to hear the the feedback, and I think for people that are you know that don't know a lot about it, this could help them get a get a feel. Sure. For, you know what they might be able to do, and yeah, that's you know the there's definitely obviously you got to have that you know that dedication. So that's a, that's a big part of it. What do you think is you know your favorite other than the stuff you've written? Um, you know, do you have a favorite uh, resource or book or magazine or some other you know fly fishing information that's out there that you enjoy reading or consuming? You bet. You bet. I, I, I read a lot, uh, within our sport. And I think that, uh, uh, well, Ed Engel has, has a tremendous amount. I grew up reading Ed Engel's material and, mm-hmm. and, um, in the last 10 years, we've gotten to be very close friends and oftentimes fish several times a year. But I, I admire Ed because he's, uh, not only is a very authentic and, and, uh, and, uh, just a genuine person, but it, He's an excellent angler, but he also brings that scientific element to it. So I've always had, myself, I've had an affinity to his work, and I've enjoyed reading it. Um, Landon's work, he's got a new book out, is uh, is really, really good. Um, mm-hmm. He's worked on, on not only giant trout, but some of his newer material uh, focuses on mastering the short game he's got a new dvd out george daniel i find him very readable yeah. and uh very informative yeah, he, he's blogging he, he's got a new goal to to blog on, oh, yeah. on a regular basis so i i'll have to i'll put a link in the show notes to, to some of his stuff as well oh for sure and he's he's uh his material is very relevant and these, these are all really good guys too and you know i'll be you know, I have a chance to fish with these guys this year, and and uh, they're so great about sharing information. There's so much camaraderie, um, and and uh, just we enjoy each other, and we have fun, and it shows in in uh, not only the writing, but it shows we we uh, really uh, do uh, enjoy fishing together, and it just kind of emphasizes that. So that's a really important aspect of our sport mm-hmm. from top to bottom. Is it's it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you see yourself once you fully retire to, I guess you're just going to continue on the getting on the, the circuit, more of the, the fly fishing kind of show circle. Are you going to stay with that? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I've, I'm kind of semi-retired from, uh, you know, from general practice, uh, and have been for a little bit, but, uh, I usually do, Oh, somewhere around between 20 and 25 different events per year at this point. And I don't know if I'll probably take much more than that. It's pretty busy. Yeah. Um, you know, the month of January, um, I think I was home on an average about two days a week, uh-huh. um, between shows and clubs and events and, yeah. and those types of things. And I, I just, I love meeting people and just, discussing and sharing our passions with it and you learn a ton people are sharing their ideas with you and yeah. and uh i think i really enjoy the educational aspect of it and being on the on the show and event circuit i think really allows you to connect with those people and and uh to to share those ideas nice nice was there a you know when you think back you know i you mentioned you started fly fishing when you were pretty young right um, I f- started fishing when I was pretty young, fly fishing, uh, probably 25 or 30 years ago. Oh, okay. 25, 30 years ago. Good. So you've been doing it, uh, I'm not sure your age, but you've been doing it for 20, 20 years or so somewhere in that uh, quite a while, right? Quite a while. Yeah. But I'm, uh, you know, I started fishing, uh, 30 years. As a matter of fact, I spent a little bit of time as a, as a tournament bass angler, oh, wow. um, in the early nineties and, and, uh, did some local tournaments, not on the large scale, but I did some of the local, uh, small scale stuff and enjoyed that. Um, and then just got, just got captivated by fly fishing and I pretty much, I still do some tackle fishing, um, uh, but I, I probably do 90 eight percent fly fishing gotcha gotcha okay did you ever think about going uh kind of all in on the fly fishing uh, back in the in the past where you thought maybe you could make that a full-time thing or has it always been just kind of a site plan for doing the side gig yeah it's most of the people that are doing uh like the circuit or writing or books or teaching um it's it's it ends up being about a half time position. Yeah. Um, the other half might be uh, guiding during right. the guide season, right. like Landon and George do. Um, and uh, but for for a lot of other people, like well, like Gary Borger yeah. was a yeah. uh, college professor right. in botany. Uh, that was his uh, full time job, and he did um, the fly fishing then as, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as his second 
full time job. That's right. And then I uh, like well, like Bob Clauser was a, a, a he was a, a professional butcher. Hmm. Um, and so a yeah. lot of these guys had different jobs, and then. But many of them are guides, and they they do this during the off season, the the teaching, the writing. They do a lot of their work in, you know, December, January, February, March, April, and then they go back to full time guiding when when the conditions are are back and they're back on the water every day. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, we're uh, we're getting closer. Are you ready for? I've got a little rapid fire round uh, to finish this. Absolutely. Up. You, you get to jump in. Okay. Is this like double jeopardy? Yeah, or it kind of is. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right. This is just. Okay. Uh, I'm some, ready. Yeah, I've got some questions that are some are some are a little <laughs> random. Some are not. So just okay. just uh, instead of uh, we'll just zip through a bunch just to to get through them. And um, one of them I've been uh, you know asking on a number of and I'm not sure if you have a a good answer for this, but well, I guess we can start off with the drift. But I I, I heard that you know, you do some drift boat fishing if you had to choose between you know fishing from a drift boat or fishing uh, off of the bank say you could get to the fish in the same you know fashion um, what, what would what would you do on foot oh, okay. on the bank or in the water I, that's the most intimate relationship i have with the river i love that you like being there on foot yeah, don't mind the drift boat either. Okay, okay, but cool. That's my preference. And what's your as far as boats? I'm not sure if you do all sorts of boats, or do you have a favorite yep. favorite style or type of boat you like to use? You know, I I think the drift boat is uh, is kind of that classic fly fishing boat. I've got a hide boat and I've yeah. fished with Matt Hyde and oh, yeah. and. Uh, but I like the jet sleds as well. We're going to steelhead fish next week. We're going to be on jet sleds and Alaska. We're on sleds. Yeah. I mean, uh, but I think if I think of it, I like the solitude and silence of that drift boat. Yeah. What, what do you like about the hides? I've never, I've never rode a hide. The hide, I got that uh, heavy duty shoe. That's really uh, almost kind of almost indestructible. I guess in, in my hands, nothing's indestructible completely, <laughs> but um, it's just a tough boat and it handles like a, a dream. Um, yeah. And uh, even a guy that doesn't row a boat uh, seven days a week um, can, can handle it. Yeah. Have you ever been in a clack of craft? Uh, yep. Are they, sure are they pretty similar boats? Very similar. Yeah. Yep. They're both. I mean, that's kind of the fiberglass boats. It seems like those are the two companies. I'm not sure if there's other yep. ones out there. There are, but those are they're probably the two well-known ones anyway. Gotcha. Okay. How about your, um, do you have a favorite uh, band or type of music you like to listen to? Classic rock probably is what I grew up with, went to college in. Uh-huh. Anything from Marshall Tucker to Led Zeppelin. I love country music. Sawyer Brown, uh, uh-huh. you know, Rodney Atkins. Sure. Uh, Johnny Cash, oh, yeah. uh, Frank Williams, uh, senior, uh-huh. um, that kind of stuff. Cool. Patsy Klein. Patsy. Uh, I grew up with that, but I love, I love, uh, I love me some classic rock. Yeah, too. me too. I'll, I'll throw it. I haven't had Zeppelin up yet, so I'll throw uh, some Zeppelin in the, in the show notes. So yeah. What, what Creedence. Oh, Creedence, right. of course. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, how about your, uh, favorite, uh, beverage when you get off the river? Moscow Mule. Oh, yeah. Moscow. Cool. All right. And you mentioned the line before, but, you know, uh, the rod reel line. Do you have a a type of, you know, a a rod reel line companies you like to use? You bet. uh, I'm a national advisor for Temple Fork Outfitters, TFO. And uh, I've had the opportunity to work with some of the greatest professionals in the industry and design um, the new drift rod for TFO is just a delightful uh, kind of a versatile rod that that converts to um, a nine foot dry fly rod, ten foot nymphing rod, maintains perfect balance, very functional, serviceable rod for the the guy that loves just to carry one rod mm-hmm. at a time, doesn't want to rig up three rods, and but loves to wander the stream and river. So uh, we're working on a new rod for TFO called the Stealth, and it's going to co- hopefully come out by the end of this year which is a dedicated nymphing rod yeah. so um, I've, I've got a, I love TFO's position in the in the uh, industry in the sport and their philosophy it's a family philosophy mm-hmm. man you break something they get it back they in do. your hands they do I've had yeah, a, they're phenomenal I can attribute to that yeah I had a spay rod that uh, I just broke and yeah they 
They uh, replaced it, no problem. And I did actually talked to Rick uh, recently. We were chatting oh, on the phone. Oh, cool guy. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to have him on eventually. And yeah, it was a good conversation. Oh, but he mentioned that, um, you know, TFO, I guess there's a lot of companies that do this, but they have a good chunk. I guess probably a majority of their sales come from more gear type rods. But fly fishing is more of a, I wouldn't say secondary thing, but, you know, there's a lot of money yeah. on the other side as well. Well, they started in fly fishing, I think, and, and they do a lot of uh, classic spinning and, and bait casting rods as well. But uh, they're a fly fishing, I think, that's their, their main, uh, has been their main uh, directive. Uh, yeah. But they're, they have great products at good prices, and it's a family company, mm-hmm. and it's just a, a great atmosphere. Scientific Anglers is, uh, yeah. is uh, a line that I've worked with. I, I like Scientific Anglers a lot because they're super responsive to angler needs. Uh-huh. They really want to get products that we need right. um, <laughs> in our hands that are going to perform extremely well. And, and uh, they're a super company, and I've enjoyed working with them and, and um, just – yeah, I think those types of things, uh, Smith optics is, yeah. I just got a pair of Smith glasses and holy smoke. I'll tell you what, what a difference that makes. I mean, Landon's always been making fun of me cause he's like the king of fish spotting and the guy's like, oh, right. candy. but uh, you know, I'm always, he's always like pointing him and says, don't you see that? He says, you need some Smith glasses. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, okay. Yeah. It can't be that big a deal. Well, I got some Smith glasses it's a big deal. It makes a big difference. Yeah. So those are some products that <clears throat> I'm a poor salesman. I can't sell something that, that, uh, I couldn't sell ice in the desert, but if, if there's something I believe in and, yeah. and those types of things, I can share that passion because, uh, you know, because it's a conviction at that point for me. And these are products that I believe in and I use every time I go to the river. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Smith. And what are they, I mean, what's a average, I, I guess I've been on this, this muddy piece. It's just been interesting to me. But yeah, Smith, they're kind of top of line, but you'll pay a few hundred dollars for a pair of glasses. Or a... Well, mine are prescription, so I don't know oh, if right. I have a Different true level. perspective on that because I had to get progressive. Yeah, yeah you're, up in the, you're up in the thousand or two thousand there. I, I've got, no, yeah. no, not that bad. Definitely not that bad, but it's probably more than a hundred bucks. Gotcha. I have a, a, a <laughs> company on, we have a little a group that's more small to medium sized companies, uh, fly fishing and outdoor companies involved in a little group, but, um, you know, Breakline Optics is one of the companies and, you know, they're, I think there's a lot of companies out there doing products. I mean, rods are another good example. You've got how many rod companies are out there? Oh, that, who can count? Yeah, right. I there's mean, always somebody new. There's somebody new. And from what I've heard, it sounds like they're all pretty darn good rods. You know, it, it, it's hard to like, how do you choose, you know, how do you choose what to go with? I mean, you obviously TFO is uh, somebody you work with. So you found some good success there. Well, I think it's relationships for me. Um, you know, I think it's all about the people that stand behind those products and the consistency and quality. <clears throat> and I think sometimes that's overlooked in, in some of the, the newer, I don't I want to call them upstart rock yeah. companies because it's, it's, uh, it doesn't, uh, directly accurately describe it. But, you know, I think, um, I, I don't want to, you know, the same sure. thing, uh, negative because sure. a lot of those rock companies, I'm just not familiar with yeah. them. I've not, I've, I don't know anybody there and I've not had a personal relationship with them. And yep. so I don't know, they may have good products and they may have good service and warranty, but, uh, I know the people and have known many, many years, the people at TFO, Rick Pope and the yep. quality of these people and, and Frank Paul King and, and the people that they've associated themselves with. I think my mom used to tell me, you can tell a lot of, about a person by the company they keep. Right. Right. Yeah, and so yep. the company that TFO keeps are people like Lefty Cray for so many years. Uh, right. he's just been a fixture right. with TFO. I actually got one of his rods. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And Bob Clauser and Ed Jabarowski, these are these are the top people, but not only skills, but just in 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 reputation and integrity. I mean they they've surrounded themselves with people that have that philosophy of of uh, caring and concern for the angler. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think they they do a good job. There's probably some <clears throat> Some questions there. You always have the overseas, you know, thing that comes up. We've talked a little, oh, yeah. a little bit about it on here, and I'm not, I'm not even sure which companies manufacture <laughs> at home versus manufacture abroad. But it, it seems like right. there, there's a little, a little uh, overlap. But um, 
Okay. So no, that's a good, I mean, I think, you know, these conversations, it's always tough to, tough to cut them off because, you know, there's a lot we can chat about, but I got a, a few more for, uh, for you here. Um, one of them, I've been talking about sports and it's funny when I mentioned this to people, you know, kind of like what, what were the sports you played or you did, you know, back in the day, I've had some interesting, I mean, uh, Denny Rickards was pretty much a professional baseball player. Okay. We've had, uh, you know, uh, Rachel Finn was like a three sport athlete. Did you have any sports that you, you, were into before you know before fly fishing or any i did life? yep i did uh, uh a competitive uh performance riding um so i did reining and roping oh, wow. uh, event riding yep cool so i did that for several years until i broke too many bones yeah. and realized that fly fishing is just it's, yeah it's not necessarily easy on your body That's scrambling crazy. over a stream but it's definitely not the same as falling off a running horse oh no. i mean so so you're out there on the horse roping doing the in the in the ring doing that deal yeah I, I, I did it. I wouldn't say I was great at it. Uh, I've got a few ribbons to say that at least I, I, I did uh, some things. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I did that for a few years. I played uh, football in high school uh-huh. and, and, uh, that's, uh, yeah. well, probably about it. I'm a the, lousy golfer. Yeah. <laughs> what's the, well, the roping, uh, what's the, you know, characteristic that makes a good rope? Is that the title, the roper or what is the? Yeah, reining and roping is is the kind of uh, performance riding that I used to do. But you know, you're chasing a, a steer that's uh, you know you've got three things involved. You've got a horse that's thinking one thing and a steer that's thinking another, and you're trying to think for both of them. <laughs> and uh, it it ends up being rather comical and, until somebody gets hurt, which yeah. is usually you. Yeah. Um, and so um, I've had times where the the the, the steer cuts one way and the horse goes with the steer and you don't you keep going you know in in that direct line of travel and and you're out there by yourself and and there's no horse underneath you anymore and hitting the ground at some point is is uh yeah it's it's different you ever you ever break any bones or have any big injuries several yeah yep several yep cool so um yeah broken arm dislocated elbows cracked sternums yep cracked heads well i I guess that makes sense with the veterinary you were kind of in that field that was was the roping before that or during yeah it was uh just after that yep Exactly. And so slow learner, uh, but eventually after a couple of collisions, you think, man, there's got to be easier way to spend your leisure time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What, um, so steelhead versus trout, if you had to pick one, one trout, trout, stay with trout. So steelhead doesn't, doesn't kind of, it, it's fun, but you gotta, I guess it's not as much of the etymology and all that, that piece. I love it. Yeah. It's problem solving, right? I mean, you get to go to the river, you get to, to do all of those aspects of it, but you get to put yourself to a problem. Not the steelhead fishing is not, um, <clears throat> but steelhead fishing. Um, I love it and I enjoy doing it with the, the guys that I do it. But to me, uh, and I've done saltwater fishing, I've done, uh, some bone fishing and permit not a tremendous amount i'm kind of you know recently introduced to that side Mm -hmm. of the sport too i love it but to me walking in that trout stream um throwing a a a little a parachute atoms uh, on a three weight rod um to a 16 ounce brown trout uh, 16 pound uh, i'm sorry 16 inch brown trout is is (laughs) 16 pound would be good that'd be nice too that would be okay yeah Yeah. i tried that in labrador on on some of their big fish up there and and some of their uh, landlocked uh, atlantic salmon and i've tried I've I've tried targeting big browns, but uh, I, I just like I love to wander the spring creeks. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, well, I got one last a big one here. Um, sure. Just, uh, the two the two twenty two. So that your top two flies, um, tips and resources. Maybe just start off with you mentioned a couple of flies, but do you have two flies if you're fishing, uh, you know, doing the wet fly uh, swing or whatever that you'd start off with. Yep. Two flies. Uh, I'm kind of an old school picket uh, pin kind of a guy with queen of the waters and stuff like that. I love those mm-hmm. flies. I do a lot more nymph fishing. Um, what what than, percentage than, do you do if you say nymph versus uh, dry versus wet flies? Uh, probably 80% oh, wow, nymph okay. fishing, 20% dries, wet fly streamers and other stuff. Okay. You know, and, and so um, I just find that that is the method that the stream indicates is going to be the most successful. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, those types of things. And, um, you know, just, just 
love wandering up and down those spring creeks. The three Fs, uh, four Fs uh, in my life, you know, it's faith, family, friends, and fly fishing. Yep. There you go. You know that that's that, and I I can find all those things pretty Wait, much. Is that spring is that five S fly fishing or is that four? Well, it depends on how you count them, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it could be five. All right, all right. Um, and um, do you have? Let's say, well, let's let's finish the two to do. So, do you have two uh, just fly fishing tips in general? I guess we could focus still on the wet flags since we we're trying to keep that that little theme. Any tips you might give somebody, and if you can't, you know, just some general tips. For I think uh, for anything, for any method that you're going to do is 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 challenge yourself. Think outside the box. Don't just go to the river and do what you've done. It is all, and I'm blessed to fish with so many great anglers and, and really good quality anglers. And the thing that that really identifies that sometimes is really just continuing to challenge yourself to grow and develop and and to think outside the box and the norm and if what you're doing is not working then quit doing it and do something different put a different yeah. fly on try a different technique i think that's what really i think sets apart um, you know really uh, uh, a good angler from a very good angler yeah. uh, is the fact that they continue to adapt they continue to change they continue right. um, not to, stuck to with question the so if you're out there and you've done a lot of you know swinging wet flies and you're going out to the water is there any tip you would give somebody if they're just sitting there and they're not catching any fish they're swinging flies or swinging flies and and nothing's going on is there any uh tip you might give somebody trying to get one take a look and see what's on the menu i think um you know sometimes it's just look under a rock or mm -hmm. one time i was fishing with tom baltz and ed jabrowski and we were fishing and and uh you know we were trying to figure out what fly might be working or why we're not catching fish and you know they were looking at uh even things like uh, you're looking along the stream side vegetation they see spider webs and they're looking yeah. and and they see a husk of a mayfly in a spider web and they're like holy smoke you know yep. these must have come off last night let's try this let's try a sulfur now or a hendrickson and and i was fishing uh with joe humphreys he's like pick up a rock and look underneath it's crawling with grass bugs and right. little tiny mayfly nymphs and he put those flies on and, and those things work so i think realizing that that uh, nymph, uh that i'm sorry fly fishing is a problem solving exercise just continue um, to challenge yourself. And, and when I, I teach people nymph fishing, uh, I do a lot of teaching of that at the shows and on stream uh, opportunities in schools is just challenge every drift. Was this drift good? Did I get two points of contact? Did I, did I catch something? Did it go by too fast? Did I not get to the bottom? analyze and, and don't forget um, to question, you know, everything that we do and say, okay, if I didn't catch a fish, what was wrong with this drift gotcha okay cool you'll, you'll you'll catch more fish with the wrong fly in the right presentation than you will with the right fly in the wrong presentation right. you, fly selection is important don't get me wrong fly selection is very important but presentation is is king yep 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 okay and so in the next six to 12 months anything uh you want to um let us know you have going on anything new coming up or anything <coughs> you bet i mean i'm i'm uh I, I get a chance to fish i'm going to be bouncing around and fishing with some good friends uh and, and hitting those streams i'm hosting a trip um to chile oh cool and i've got a couple couple spots left on that it's at lakataya lodge in chile which is a helicopter fly out lodge where we're gonna go and we've got a great rate negotiated with it so anybody mm. that's got some time next february yeah. um we're gonna be every day they, they helicopter you into another remote river that sees almost no anglers and and uh, has the opportunity to That's catch cool. some of these That's really cool. really big migratory browns and big big brook trout yep yep and and that hosting how does that work with the lodge you basically this is a partner well like you said you 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 connect uh, build a relationship with the lodge and then you're able to and you're looking for yep. people even people you don't know whoever just wants to join you bet. You bet. And it's just a, an opportunity to go down there and, and uh, maybe if you've got a buddy or a friend, you can you can have somebody you know on the trip. But meeting new people and, and the chance to share information and, and we'll do a little bit of an educational program down there probably as well. You know, if somebody wants to work a little bit on casting or presentation or uh, mousing, it's a huge opportunity to catch some great fish on, on mousing. But they're getting, you know, the some of the, the uh, migratory brown 
browns up to 14, 15 pounds and some great, great fish and, and the food and the experience and, and, uh, the camaraderie that you have and, and, uh, that type of thing. But it is, we're able to, cause we're trying to fill their lodge for a specific time, uh, um, uh, segment that for us is that first February week in February, okay. we get a great rate. And yeah. so, I mean, being able to get down there and, and, uh, you know, sh- spend time together and, and maybe do some educational, um, aspect to it. They can certainly connect with me on Instagram at Jason Randall fly fishing or on Facebook um, on my name as well. Or they can hit me on my website at jrflyfishing.com and, and get in touch with me for them. If, if uh, okay. But uh, it's really a great opportunity to to uh, have that type of uh, once-in-a-lifetime experience. Yeah, no, that's cool. That's cool. And, uh, okay, well, and if, uh, like you mentioned, so the Instagram is the best place to find you. And, um, you bet. Yeah, okay, great. Well, uh, Jason, thanks for coming on and sharing. Um, you know, I, I think uh, we've definitely dug into some things here. I'm always interested, you know, there's a bunch of questions I still have on, on some of the hosting, but I'll have to leave that for, you know, another time. I, oh, absolutely. You know, I'll be happy to, yeah. to share that on another program or something down the road with you as well. Yeah, yeah. And thank you for the opportunity, and thank you for bringing this type of, of information content, uh, into our sport. And, and I think that's tremendous. Uh, yeah. it's another way of, of, uh, maybe connecting with people, yep. uh, and sharing that type of information yeah. and passion, the things that we love. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I think that's, that's the, that what kind of got me into it. I think that that's the common thing with everybody is that there are some benefits, you know, like you're saying, even the traveling, I mean, that's one of my things I hope to, to do more of. And, and maybe, you know, the, the show and some of the stuff I'm doing can help me, you know, get out there and meet some people and do the same. So yeah, it's good to see you're out there traveling, you're doing it and you're, you know, I definitely have to pick your brain when I get to that point, uh, you know, have some of those questions. So, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll keep in touch and, uh, and check back with you later on. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. See ya. Good night. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash seven, four. I'd love to have you go a little deeper with the podcast and some of our member partner companies at Wet Fly Swing, uh, the member society. We are supporting local companies, podcasting, and you along your journey. That's uh, wetflyswing.com slash members to find out how to get exclusive discounts and bonuses and connect with a bunch of great companies uh, along the way. Thanks for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon. I hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.